Hello, everybody. Welcome to EKG Fundamentals. My name is Shannon Lamb. I am one of the educators at Baylor St. Luke. And today we are going to go through a class that will assist you in, of course, um, helping your patients on the unit by analyzing their telemetry and doing so in an accurate and precise manner so that we can give them a correct diagnosis or their rhythms and any changes that may occur throughout the shift. The other thing that is going to assist you with is passing your EKG exam that you will be taking very shortly so that you are able to show that you can identify certain heart rhythms and also that you're able to do the appropriate measurements that are necessary, such as the QRS duration and the PR interval duration. We'll get into what all of that means very shortly. You should have a handout that has been provided to you that will follow along with the slides that you see on the screen. And you'll also have some practice material that we will go over towards the end of the course. So without further ado, let's begin. Here's the objective for today's lecture. Um, we will talk a little bit about the conduction system of the heart. We'll talk about the various waves that are produced on the EKG. We will, of course, discuss the analysis and interpretation of rhythm strips and our measurements of certain waveforms on the EKG strip. The first thing we'll discuss is an overview of heart function. So we know that the heart has four chambers. It has two upper chambers known as the atria and two lower chambers known as the ventricles. Blood flows generally from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart, and it moves from the atria into the ventricles. The atria fill and eject blood into the ventricle, and then the ventricle fill and eject blood either to the body or out to the lungs. On the right side, it's to the lungs, and on the left side, it's to the body. So it's very important that our heart is in correct working order so that we're able to perfuse our lungs and get fresh oxygen and waste removal and also to be able to perfuse the rest of the body and get blood to the brain, the kidneys, the liver, all of our end organs. And that's really why we want our patients to be in an optimal heart rhythm and have the best heart function that's possible. That's always our end goal is good cardiac output and end organ perfusion. So why might someone need an EKG? Well, an EKG is going to take a look at the person's electrical heart function and it looks at it from different angles based off of the different leads that we look at the heart within. This assists us with understanding how the electrical conduction is working. We all know that the electrical conduction is what helps the mechanical aspect or the actual pumping of the heart to function. So if our electronics are in good working order, then our actual functionality and movement is going to be in good working order. So we like to have people be in sinus rhythm because that is the best way to get the most cardiac output and the best squeeze out of the muscle and the best function. If we wanted to actually take a look at the movement of the chambers of the heart, then we would get an echocardiogram on our patient, which is just an ultrasound that actually looks at the movement of the muscle itself. We have basic and advanced EKGs. We do have 12 lead EKG, which would be considered a more advanced form. We're able to look at more angles of the heart and derive more information from a 12 lead EKG. But for the purposes of our class today, we are going to be looking at five lead EKGs. And in particular, we will always be looking at our rhythm strips in lead two. So you don't have to worry about learning all these different leads today. You just need to know what things should look like in lead two. There's typical lead placement for our five lead EKGs. So we have five leads, of course. We have the right arm, which is white, the right leg, which is green. So the right arm and the right leg, we say sky over grass. We have the left arm and the left leg. The left arm is black and the left leg is red. And we say there's smoke over fire. We also have a V lead and the V lead is brown. And I like to say that chocolate goes close to your heart because we all love chocolate, right? So if your patient has not had any type of surgical procedure, such as a sternotomy or open heart surgery, we can place the V lead generally in V1, as long as they have available skin with no scarring or dressings or anything there. If they have had a sternotomy, we wouldn't want to place that lead around their incision because it could contaminate or cause infection. So we would want to move that lead into the V6 position, which is just on the left side of the rib cage in the mid axillary line. We like to look at our leads, um, V2 and V1, or lead two, my apologies, and V1 typically. We like to look at lead two because it follows the natural conduction of the heart. 
so when we look at the conduction of the heart, we have the SA node. It lives in the upper right-hand corner of the heart. And the point of maximal impulse or the apex of the heart sits down in the bottom left corner of the heart. So lead two reads from the negative to the positive. The positive is kind of where the eyeball is or the camera, you could say. And so our general waveforms in sinus rhythm are gonna be moving from the right upper side to the left lower side. So this allows us to pick up most dysrhythmias on the patient. We also like to look at V1 if we're looking at two leads at a time. And we like to look at V1 because it looks at the septum. So you can see you have a septum that runs between the atria and the ventricles. The septum is where the bundle branches are in our electrical conduction. And the bundle branches, if one of them gets blocked, can cause what we know as a bundle branch block. So the V leads are very good at picking up on those bundle branch blocks that lead two isn't so good at picking up on. Our rule of electrical flow, when we have a bipolar lead, meaning there's a negative pole and a positive pole, the flow of conduction is going to run ideally towards that positive electrode. And if it does run towards that positive electrode in lead two, then we will see a positive deflection on our EKG. And that's what this looks like. Positive just means that the deflection is pointing up towards the top of the EKG paper. If we have movement away from this positive electrode, so let's say the impulse is traveling this way rather than straight this way, then we will note that we have a negative deflection, meaning that the deflection goes down towards the bottom of the EKG paper and will look inverted. So this is really important when we talk about junctional rhythms. A lot of times we have P waves on junctional rhythms, quote unquote P waves. And a lot of people think, oh, it must be a sinus rhythm because I have a P wave even though the P wave is upside down. Well, truly that P wave did not come from the sinus node. It came from the AV node. We have our sinus node right here. We have our AV node right here. And so if the AV node discharges a signal and it goes backwards and kind of touches the SA node, we'll see that upside down P wave because we're moving electrical current away from the positive electrode in lead two. It's going backwards, so it will be upside down. So just to summarize, that P wave did not come from the SA node. Your patient is not in the sinus rhythm. It's just that an impulse was discharged from the AV node and it went backwards, causing an inverted P wave to form. We also have a, of course, electrical conduction system that consists of not just the SA node and the AV node, but also other areas of the heart need to have electrical flow to them as well. So the ventricles in particular are very important. What we have is a transfer of electricity from the SA node to the AV node. Then we have a little area here known as the bundle of his. The bundle of his goes into the right and left bundle branches, as you see right here, those sit in the septum, as we previously discussed. And then we have many little electrical fibers that branch off of those known as the Purkinje fibers. And those go into the ventricles and innervate the ventricles so that they can squeeze together and generate pressure and send blood either to the lungs on the right side or send blood out to the system on the left side and generate good blood pressure and cardiac output. We have intrinsic rate based off of the nodes and areas of the electrical conduction system. So within the SA node, our intrinsic or normal rate is going to be 60 to 100 beats per minute. And it's very important for you to remember all of these rates um, for your test and of course for your patients in general. So if you need to jot some little notes and write them down or whatever makes it easier, please just make sure that you memorize them in some fashion. So the SA node normal is 60 to 100 beats per minute. If the SA node can't function, what will happen is the heart smart. So it's going to divert and cause the AV node to become the pacemaker of the heart. So if the AV node becomes the pacemaker of the heart, our natural conduction uh, rate for the AV node is going to be 40 to 60 beats per minute. So it's a little bit slower than the SA node, as you can see. If the AV node can no longer function, then we will drop down into the ventricular system and that will become the pacemaker of the heart. So that means that we'll drop down to an even lower rate likely, somewhere between 20 and 50 beats per minute. So the issue, what, what will occur if this happens is we have our cardiac output also dropping because cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. So if our stroke volume is okay, but our heart rate continues to drop lower and lower and lower, it's going to affect our cardiac output. And unfortunately for most of these patients, their stroke volume is not very good. And then we add on to that a low heart rate and it can cause them to really have a drop in their perfusion and their ability to send blood to their end organs, like their blood, brain, and kidneys. 
So again, we like to keep our patients uh, with the SA note as the pacemaker of the heart, firing at 60 to 100 beats per minute and allowing good perfusion. We have several different waves that we see on our EKG. We have P wave um, being our atrial firing. We have a Q, R, and S. We call that the QRS complex, and that's our ventricle contracting. And then we have a T wave, which is the repolarization of the ventricle. Your atria actually do repolarize, but they repolarize, of course, in the middle of the QRS complex. So on your EKG, it's going to pick up the biggest thing that it sees that generates the most electrical currency. And the ventricles generate a lot more electrical currency than the atria. So we don't actually see the atria repolarized. It happens in the middle of that complex and it's hidden. We have different intervals that we will discuss further about. You have your PR interval, your QRS complex we had, and then your QT interval. You also have different segments the ST segment being a very uh, important area because if we see elevation or depression there, it can signal that our patient may be having some type of heart attack. And then the only complex is the QRS complex as we already discussed. You have depolarization and repolarization that can be viewed on the ECG. So depolarization means that the heart is receiving the electrical impulse. We have a shift in electrolytes and it causes a large change in the electrical currency. And that shows up as a wave on your EKG. So we have our P wave and we also have our QRS complex. We have repolarization, which is the resting phase of the cardiac cycle. And that means that we have another shift in electrolytes and the cell is just coming back to a resting state so that it can depolarize once more. And repolarization would be symbolized from what we can see by our T wave on the EKG. Our SA node is the pacemaker of the heart in ideal circumstances. So we like it to be the pacemaker of the heart because as I said previously, it allows for good cardiac output and it allows for good functionality of the heart. The SA node is located in the wall of the right atrium. It's at the junction of the superior vena cava. So it's in that upper right corner and it has specialized cells that are able to generate impulses at 60 to 100 beats per minute. We also have P waves. P waves begin in the SA node and they're demonstrated um, by the P wave actually on the EKG. So when you see your P wave, it means that your atria are contracting. And if you see a nice upright and rounded P wave, as you see in this example, that means that our atria are contracting in a normal fashion and likely that it's the sinus node that has generated that atrial contraction. Remember we're talking about in lead two. We also have different morphology of our P wave. So here you can see a nice rounded upright P wave that's normal. We can also have a notched P wave. So I want to point this out because on your exam, you will see an example of this type of P wave. And we want to make sure that when we measure the PR interval for this P wave, that we start at the beginning of the P wave and measure all the way to where we leap baseline. We don't wanna start measuring in the middle of this P wave because the whole thing is the P wave. So we need to measure from the beginning all the way to the end in order to get the correct answer. We can have peaked P waves. And as we discussed previously, we have inverted P waves. Now inverted P waves do not come from the SA node. They come from the AV node. This is a junctional rhythm right here. And that impulse is just sent backwards and shows up as an upside down P wave on our EKG. Our AV node is the next runner up. So if the SA node is not able to perform its function, the heart will usually drop down and it will cause the AV node to become the pacemaker of the heart. It has other functions other than the SA node's backup though. It slows the conduction of the electrical impulse uh, from the atria and it decides how long it needs to hold on to it and whether it's safe for it to send it down to the ventricle or not. So our PR interval is a good indication of what's going on with our AV node. Sometimes in our blocks, we get a prolongation of the PR interval and that can indicate that the AV node is not functioning uh, the way that it should be. We also have rhythms that are very, very rapid in the atria like AFib. We can have our atria beating to upwards of 400 beats per minute. So what the AV node does is it does not let all 400 of those impulses travel down to the ventricle and make our patient's heart rate 400 beats per minute. That would not be good. It only selects certain beats and allows them to go down. So we know AFib is an irregular rhythm. And what happens is we have 
different discharges and the AV node will allow certain ones to go down and then it backs off and doesn't allow others to go down because we don't want our heart rate to be in the upwards of 400 beats per minute. So the intrinsic rate of the AV node is 40 to 60 beats per minute. It's a little bit slower than the SA node. So if we are in a true junctional rhythm, junctional rhythms come from the AV node, then our heart rate is going to be a little bit slower and our cardiac output is going to be a little bit less. We have our PR interval. We will be measuring the PR interval for the purposes of our exam. So it's very important for you to understand what normal is for the PR interval. A normal PR interval is from 0.12 to 0.20 seconds. If we measure that on our paper, we'll talk about measurements in a couple of slides, but we're always measuring on these white spaces here. We're not measuring on the green lines, we're measuring the white spaces. So a normal PR interval will last from three to five white spaces. Very, very important for you to memorize that to be able to identify the normal PR interval for your patient and also to get the answers correct on your exam when it asks you to measure the PR interval. So here you can see on our little image, we were up here at the SA node, we've now dropped down to the AV node. The AV node sits at the junction of the atria and the ventricle. So it's also a good thing that can help you remember that junctional rhythms come from the AV node, which sits at the AV junction. Next, we have the QRS complex. The QRS complex symbolizes the depolarization of the ventricle. So if we have QRS complexes on our EKG, that's a good thing. So that means that our ventricles are contracting and our patient is probably alive. So we wanna identify those QRS complexes right away when we're looking at our telemetry or our patient strip. When we go to measure the QRS complex, we need to measure the whole thing. So sometimes people will measure only to here on their QRS complex but we have to measure the entire thing. So we wanna measure all the way up until that QRS complex starts to turn into the ST segment, and that's called the J point. So if we only measured down to this point on this first QRS complex, we probably would have said that it was about a box and a half, one white space and a half, but we need to finish it off and measure the whole thing. And that would give us a measurement of two boxes. So our measurement would be incorrect if we did not measure the QRS complex from beginning to end. It's very important for you to also know your normals for the QRS complex measurements. So normal is 0 0.04 to 0 0.12 seconds. And if we measure that in boxes, that's one to three white boxes. So memorize that somehow or write it down a few times so that you can have it stick in your brain. Um, so that for your exam, again, when you're asked to measure QRS complexes, you're able to achieve the correct answer. As we move down further um, into the ventricle, we start to see that our heart rate drops down even lower. If we move from the bundle of his, then we have the right and left bundle branches and finally the Purkinje fibers. The other thing that happens if our patient is having their pacemaker be derived from down here in the ventricle is that the conduction becomes a lot less efficient. So it takes a lot longer for the muscle to be um, squeezed and depolarized. And that means that our QRS complex starts to get very wide on our EKG. So if the impulse comes from the AV node or the SA node, the QRS complex is going to be within those normal limits of 0 0.04 to 0 0.12 seconds. But when we get down into the ventricle being the pacemaker of the heart, then the QRS complex is going to become wide and it's going to become greater than 0 0.12 seconds. So putting it on paper, just to review what all of our measurements mean, we have these very dark grid lines on our EKG paper. Those symbolize a large box. A large box is made up of five small boxes and a large box in time is 0 0.20 seconds. A small box is 0 0.04 seconds. So it's important for you to understand the small boxes in particular because that's what's going to help you to measure those small intervals like the PR interval and the QRS complex. Remembering also that when you look at your ECG, it's kind of like a graph. So along the bottom of the graph here is going to be your time, time in seconds. So the wider something is or the more white boxes it takes up, the longer it's taking to occur. Running up and down this way, we have amplitude. So amplitude is just the amount of electricity that is being discharged and generated. So that's why if we talk about amplitude, usually the P wave is a lot lower amplitude than say the QRS complex because the ventricle takes up a lot more electricity than the atria does. This is to show you that um, every hash mark on your strip, it um, shows three seconds of the strip. You'll be always looking uh, for your exam at six second strips. 
So when we start talking about how to measure the heart rate, it's important to understand that you're always looking at a six second strip. We have the isoelectric line, which helps us to identify where different waveforms start and stop. So for our P wave, we'll start measuring the P wave when we leave the isoelectric line and we'll stop measuring when we come back down the PR interval, obviously I'm talking about now, we'll start measuring at the beginning of the P wave. We'll finish when we start to move into the QRS complex. So as soon as we leave baseline and the QRS complex starts, that will symbolize the end of your PR interval measurement. To measure the QRS complex, we'll start as soon as we leave the baseline here and we'll go through the whole QRS complex and we end our measurement when we reach our baseline again and turn into the SP segment at the J point. SC segments can also be something that can cause issues for our patient. Um, we want to be able to identify if they're having any struggles as far as a potential heart attack. So if the SC segment is elevated, that can mean that the patient is having a STEMI. So that's a very serious heart attack. We would want to get help for that patient right away. Uh, we have a special team at the hospital here that we would call. We would call the emergency number 444444 and let them know that our patient is potentially having a STEMI and then the whole STEMI team would come out and assist the patient. So we would want to identify that right away. We could also have ST depression. So that's symbolized down here, ST depression. It could mean that your patient's having a heart attack if it's new ST depression. If it's longstanding ST depression, then we would want to assess the patient's symptoms, see if they're having any signs of chest pain or anything else that could be related to the heart attack. And of course we would um, assess and call the appropriate help in accordingly. We also have an interval on the EKG called the QT interval. The QT interval begins at the start of the Q wave and goes all the way to the end of the T wave. So our QT interval, it tells us how long it takes the ventricle to depolarize and repolarize. We want to make sure that the QT interval stays in range. Um, the longer the QT interval gets, the longer it's taking for the patient's heart to repolarize after a heartbeat. And what can happen is if an impulse comes in and lands, say, on the middle of the QT uh, interval or in the ST segment, it can cause the patient to go into a lethal rhythm because the cells haven't quite stabilized yet. They're not quite ready to receive an impulse, and so they can act a little bit funny. So if your patient has, say, a pacemaker and it accidentally fires in here, or if the patient accidentally had a PVC, then it can cause the patient to go into a lethal rhythm known as torsades. We also need to note that many, many medications that we give our patients will prolong this QT interval. So just some examples would be antibiotics, um, sedatives like Seroquel, antiemetics like Zofran, all of those things will prolong the QT interval. And oftentimes we're giving those patients every single one of those medications in a day. On top of that, they're already taking cardiac medications, which prolong the QT interval sometimes on purpose. So we need to be measuring these QT intervals at least once a shift and making sure that we're comparing to previous trips and that the patient's QT interval isn't getting longer and longer. And if it is, then we need to notify the physician right away. So next we'll get into our steps for properly interpreting heart rhythm. If you follow these steps, you will do very well on your exam. So I would suggest memorizing them and moving through the same steps every single time for every single strip. When you identify a strip, the first thing that you wanna do is identify the P, Q, R, S, and T. So by identifying the P, Q, R, S, and T, you can understand where the waveforms are starting and stopping and where you need to be measuring the waveforms from. We want to ensure that we are identifying the correct complexes to be able to get the correct measurement. If we don't know what our P wave is or our T wave or our QRS complex, then we won't be measuring from and to the right places and it will cause us to get an incorrect answer on our exam and when we're analyzing the telemetry strip for the patient. So what we want to do first of all is find our QRS complex. I think that it sticks out the most. It's the easiest thing to identify. I call it my steeple. It's got a nice pointy top. And what it does is it allows us A, to identify a middle waveform so that we can figure out what comes before and after it. And secondly, as I said previously, if your patient has QRS complexes, then that means their ventricle is contracting and they are probably still alive and hopefully not in harm's way at that current time. So that's why I like to identify it first. If you have a QRS complex, you have to have a T wave. If your heart depolarizes, it has to repolarize. 
So we can't always see the T waves very, very clearly, but I'm pointing this out to you because a lot of times people get confused between the T wave and the P wave. So in this strip, we used it as a purposeful example because your T wave is a lot smaller than your P wave is, which isn't normal. But our patients in our hospital, they have hearts that have had a few struggles along the way. They're a little bit sick. So their hearts and their rhythm shifts aren't going to look like a very textbook picture or like someone with a young, healthy heart would. So we need to be able to start to identify what's abnormal and pick out still um, the P's and T's and QRS's so that we can have accurate measurements. So here we have our QRS, which means we have our T wave here. And before the QRS complex comes the P wave. So there is our P wave. Again, step one is just to identify your complexes so that you know what you're measuring from and to. So here's our QRS. We have our T and then we have our P wave. Let's do another example. So we wanna identify our steeples first. So here's our QRS complex. If we have a QRS complex, then we have to have a T wave. So that would be our T wave. And then we have to also have a P wave in front of the QRS complex in this case. So we don't always have P's on our strips, remember. If your patient's in a junctional rhythm or some type of um, rhythm, like a ventricular rhythm, then they probably won't have a P wave because the sinus node is what generates our upright and rounded P waves. And sometimes in junctional rhythms, we could have an inverted P wave or we might not have a P wave at all. So if your patient does not have a P wave, then they are not in a sinus rhythm, just remember that. In this case, we have a notched P wave. So we would measure the entire P wave if we were measuring the PR interval, we wanna start measuring from here all the way to the end. And I bring that up again, because as I said, that will probably be coming up on your exam. You'll want to know exactly how to handle it when you see it. The next strip here is an example. We have our steeples, we have our QRF complexes, these nice tall pointy looking guys. In this case, our T wave is kind of difficult to identify, but it is right here. So that's our T wave. And then we have our P wave here. I'll point out to you in this case that T waves usually aren't pointy. So if you see a kind of pointy waveform that is in the position that you think a P wave should be, it's probably a P wave. T waves are usually more rounded um, and they don't look pointy like this. Last um, example here. So um, in this case, it's important that we identify that this in fact is our QRS complex and this is our T wave. Although it is inverted and upside down and looking a little bit odd, um, we want to make sure that if we were asked to measure our QRS complex, that we are measuring this waveform here and not this one. Uh, when I was taking the prophecy exam or the Relias exam, um, I ran across this strip and I didn't really pay very close attention. And I decided that I should measure this as this QRS complex instead of this. And I ended up getting the wrong answer because of course I was not measuring in the correct position. So identify that this is your QRS and this is your T. And then we do have P waves here. We have several P waves in a row in this situation because this patient is actually in a third degree heart block. So our next step is to determine the regularity of the strip. We all know that there's certain rhythms that are irregular and there's certain rhythms that are regular. So we need to identify regular and irregular so that we can have a better understanding of what type of heart rhythm our patient might be in. So in order to do this, what you're going to do is you're going to take a piece of paper and you're gonna hold it up to the strip on the screen and you're going to mark the top of one R wave and then with a pen on the piece of scrap paper. And then you're gonna move over to the next R wave that you see and mark the top of that with a pen on your scrap paper as well. So what you'll be left with is two pen marks on your paper. From there, you'll take that piece of paper and you'll start moving it down the strip, aligning those marks with the R wave. If the marks generally line up with the next R wave, then you'll be seeing a regular rhythm. For your exam, you want to make sure that you do every single QRS complex all the way from the beginning to the end. Sometimes on the exam, the strip will look regular just at a glance and you'll measure only part of it and it will be regular, but the end will become irregular. And in that case, the whole strip is irregular, but you may think that it was regular and it will lead you to get the wrong answer on the exam. So two rules when it comes to determining regularity. Rule number one is do not eyeball the strip. Don't just look at it and say, oh, that's regular or that's irregular. We want to use our paper method and line it up and move down the strip to just 
triple check that it actually is regular or irregular either way. The second thing is make sure you do it all the way from the beginning to the end of the strip. It doesn't take very long to move your paper down the line. So just take the time to know that you're 100% correct in understanding whether the strip is regular or irregular. It's very important. Um, if it's irregular, obviously, as you move those little brackets that you've drawn down, they're not going to line up with the next QRS complex. If it's off by more than three boxes, then we would consider that strip to be irregular. And I have created some videos as well that the links of those will be shared to you so that you can actually see in real time what I would do to determine the regularity using my piece of paper. And it will make it a little bit clearer because it's hard to get that across um, over Zoom. So you will have um, an opportunity to view those as many times as you'd like when you're practicing. So as we look at these um, examples here, um, the next thing is to measure the heart rate. So our step one was determine PQRST. Step two was to determine whether it's regular or irregular. And step three is to determine the heart rate. So we um, determine the heart rate by simply counting the QRS complexes. So remember, these are your QRS complexes, your steeples, and multiplying that number by 10. And that will give you the approximate heart rate on the strip. Now, bear in mind that on your test, you may not have an answer that correlates exactly to the number that you get but you're going to choose the answer that's closest. For example, let's say I get a heart rate of 80 and my choices are 85, 75, 50, and 100. I'm going to choose 85. Even though I got 80, I'm going to choose the closest answer and you will likely get that right on the exam. So here we can see we have an example of a regular strip. We're gonna to count to five and multiply by that by 10. That means we have a heart rate of 50. And in this example, we have five again, this is an irregular strip, but we would still count to five and multiply by 10, and that would give us a heart rate of 50 for both of these strips. So every single time I ask you to measure the heart rate, all you have to do is count these little QRS complexes and multiply by 10. Step four would be to determine our P to QRS ratio, or if we have a QRS complex for every P wave that we see. So if you have a patient in a junctional rhythm or a ventricular rhythm where there are no P waves, then you are not going to be able to perform this step and that's okay, you'll just skip over it. The reason we want to perform this step in the first place is to identify if our patient could potentially be in some type of heart block. So if we are missing QRS complexes, then likely the patient is in a second or third degree heart block and that will just help to lead you down the path to determine further analysis for what type of heart block they're in. So if we have a one-to-one -one ratio, our P to QRS, which we can see here, we have one and one, two and two, and so on all the way to seven, that would mean we have a P to QRS ratio of one-to-one. -one. But if we're missing some QRS complexes, then that ratio is not one-to-one -one anymore, and we need to start thinking potentially that the patient is in a heart block. The next step is to determine if they're missing a QRS complex, such as in this example, how the PR interval and the regularity of the rhythm is behaving. And we're going to get into that a lot more when we talk about heart block. So just remember step one, you're gonna figure out if you have too many QRS complex, or sorry, too many P waves and not enough QRS complexes. And if you do, then have that little light bulb go off in your mind that says, I'm probably in a heart block. I now need to determine what type of heart block it is. The next step is to measure the PR interval. So measuring the PR interval will measure from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex. And remember that normal is 0 0.12 to 0 0.20 seconds. So that's one big box, or sorry, my apologies. One big box is five small boxes. So it's either one big box for your maximum or three small boxes to five small boxes would be the range that we're looking at. So just remember three is boxes is 0 0.12 seconds, five boxes 0 0.20 seconds. So we want that PR interval to land somewhere in that range in order to be considered normal. If it starts to get longer than 0 0.20 seconds, then we are in some type of heart block. It could be a first degree, second degree or third degree heart block. Again, we'll talk more about the heart blocks a little bit later but we need to be able to identify when it's a little bit longer than it should be. 
There's also the option for the PR interval to be fixed or variable. If it's fixed, that means every single PR interval on your strip is going to be the same duration approximately. It could be off by say one to two boxes. If it's variable, that means that it's changing. So we have maybe a shorter one, then it gets longer, then it gets longer, or maybe one is you know 0 0.12 seconds and then the next one that you look at is 0 0.25 seconds or something like that. So if it's changing and it's not the same duration, we would say that it's variable. And sometimes on your test, it will ask you if the PR interval is fixed or variable. But you have to measure more than one so that you have an understanding of whether it's changing or not. So this is where we would measure from and to for the PR interval. We'll measure from the beginning of the P wave all the way to the beginning of the QRS complex. So if we were to measure this one, we would see that we have a full box here. So that's five plus one, two, and probably a half of a box, I would say. So we have seven and a half boxes here. We said seven to eight boxes approximately. But what we need to be able to identify number one is that this is a little bit too long because normal is three to five boxes. If it asks you to measure the PR interval on your exam, my suggestion would be, of course, to measure more than one, even if it looks like they're the same so that you can kind of take the average of what the duration is. So if we come over here and measure another one, we leave the baseline approximately at the beginning of this box. So we'll say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and probably a half boxes for this one too. So this PR interval would be considered prolonged because it's greater than 0 0.20 seconds, but it's fixed because the PR intervals are the same length as we move down the strip. Here's another example of um, measuring the PR interval. So we'll measure um, a PR interval on a complex that starts on a solid line if we can possibly find one. So let's see if we have any examples on this strip. I don't really think that we do. So in this case, my suggestion would be to bring out that piece of scrap paper again. What you're going to do is mark the P wave where it starts and then you're going to measure over to where the QRS complex starts and you're gonna put another mark there. What we can do then is we can take that paper and move it and put it on a solid grid line away from the EKG strip so that we can kind of see what the measurement looks like away from the busyness of the strip. And that can help us to very easily see how many boxes that PR interval is taking. I also have a video um, that I've posted on YouTube for how to do that. So you can watch that a few times to get a good understanding of the best way to measure the PR interval using your little brackets and moving up to the grid. So for this one, we'll do our best to just see what we need to see. This one starts fairly close to a solid line. So we'll use that one for an example. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven small boxes for this PR interval. Let's go over to the next one and measure that one. So our PA wave starts here. We've got one, two, three, four boxes. So we had seven boxes and now we have four boxes. So the seven boxes is prolonged. Four boxes is normal, right? We want three to five small boxes. But our PR interval is changing here. So we would say that this PR interval is variable on this strip. We can't assign one number to it because it's changing. So in our multiple choice answers, we'll have to say that it is variable. Step six, we want to measure the QRS complex. So we're measuring the duration of the QRS complex to understand how long it's taking the ventricles to depolarize and if it's normal or not. So with a QRS complex, we want it to be in the range of 0 0.04 to 0 0.12 seconds, which is one to three small boxes. We'll measure all the way from the beginning to the J point where the QRS turns into the ST segment to get the most accurate measurement. So here we can see we would start measuring right here where we leave baseline and we would stop measuring as we turn into the ST segment at the J point. So again, we would like to find a QRS complex that starts on a solid line if we possibly can. I think this is about the only one that starts on a solid line. So I'm gonna measure one white box and two white boxes. So this would be 0 0.08 seconds. Again, my suggestion is that you take your little scrap piece of paper, you mark on it where the QRS complex starts, and then you mark on it where the QRS complex stops, and then you move that piece of paper over to 
the grid away from the busyness of the EKG strip, line it up on one of those solid green six line boxes that begins a big box, and it will show you exactly how many boxes the QRS complex is, and it will make it a lot easier to visualize when looking at it in the busyness of the EKG strip. I also have a video about how to do that that you can refer to. So this duration would be two boxes or 0 0.08 seconds. We know that that is a normal QRS complex because it's one to three boxes per normal and this one's right in the middle at two. This example here, if we measure this QRS complex, we'll try and find one that starts on a solid line. This one starts fairly close to a solid line. I'm just gonna move in here so I can see a little bit closer. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, and we wanna go right till we turn into that ST segment. So I would say probably five to five and a half boxes for this QRS complex. As we measure that, um, we said 4.5 boxes here, but the point is that it's too big. So three to five boxes is what we are, one to three boxes, my apologies, is what we want to see. And here we have 4.5 boxes. I was even measuring more than that. Um, so that's 0 0.18 seconds, that's too long. So that means that our QRS complex is wide. What we want to stop and think about here is the fact that it's wide, so that means that we're in some type of ventricular rhythm. If you have a wide QRS complex that kind of looks like a V, that means you're in a ventricular rhythm. So you're not in sinus rhythm, you're not in a junctional rhythm, you're not in any type of atrial rhythm that's originated above the ventricle in the atria, you're in a rhythm that's originated in the ventricle, so below the junction. All right, so now we'll get into our various rhythms and how to pick these rhythms out and compare them to counterparts so that you can start to identify which rhythm is which. On your exam, you'll have a lot of questions that ask you what is the rhythm. So this will help you to be able to break down and identify um, how you can eliminate answers that are incorrect on your exam. The first rhythm will, of course, start with a sinus rhythm. So sinus rhythm is a very important rhythm to understand because if we can know what's normal, then we can compare it and see on our strip what is acting abnormal so that we can identify which areas are of concern and how they may relate to the dysrhythmias that could present themselves on our patient. So in sinus rhythm, we have electrical conduction that's coming from the SA node. It means that it's coming in an orderly fashion and it's traveling down what I like to call the fast lane highway. So it's going from the SA node to the AV node, down into the Purkinje fibers and through um, the ventricles. And it's going very quickly and it's allowing for a quick squeeze and depolarization of both the atria and subsequently the ventricles. And remember that this is going to allow us to have an optimal heart rate, and it's also going to allow us to generate the most amount of cardiac output so that we can perfuse our lungs and our end organs. The reason that we may have something that, that's called an arrhythmia is that it deviates from sinus rhythm. So this is some examples of what may cause that deviation from sinus rhythm and be considered an arrhythmia. So we'll talk through sinus rhythm. We're going to use our steps of analysis that we discussed in the last section. So let's start by talking about what is our P, what is our QRS, and what is our T. The first thing we'll pick out is our QRS, so our steeples right here. So we have our steeple. If we have a QRS complex, we have to have a T, and that would make this our P wave. So we know that we have all three pieces. That's a good start. The next thing that we'll identify is the regularity of the rhythm. So we're gonna take our piece of paper, we're going to mark our QRS complex, we're gonna mark the next QRS complex with a pen, and then we're gonna move down the strip from the beginning all the way to the end to determine if the strip is regular and it aligns with the little markings that we've made. Remember that we're not going to eyeball it and we're going to do it all the way from the beginning all the way to the end. So in this case, with our strip here, it is a regular rhythm. So we can see that sinus rhythm is a regular rhythm, so we can check off that box. The next thing that we'll do is we'll measure the heart rate. So we need to count the number of QRS complexes and multiply it by 10. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We've got eight complexes here. We're gonna multiply that by 10. That will give us a heart rate of 80. 80 runs into the normal range for sinus rhythm between 60 and 100. We will next look at our P to QRS ratio. So do we have one P for every one QRS complex? And we do have one P for one QRS complex. So that means we're probably not in any type of heart block. 
other than potentially a first degree heart block, which we'll discuss right now, actually, when we talk about the PR interval and what's normal. So we'll measure the PR interval next. We want to try and find a P wave that starts on a solid line. So I would say this one starts on this solid line right here. Remember, we're not counting the lines, we're counting the white spaces. So I'm gonna start measuring my PR interval. I can use this method or I can mark on my paper and move it up to the solid grid line if I'm having difficulty seeing. So I've got one, two, three, four, five boxes for my PR interval. Cause right after this box, we start to run into leaving baseline and going into the QRS complex. So five boxes, that's normal. Cause remember a normal PR interval is 0 0.12 to 0 0.20 seconds. And five boxes is 0 0.20 seconds. Now, if my PR interval was longer than that, but I had a P to QRS every single beat, then I would probably consider that I may be in a first degree heart block. And we'll discuss what that looks like at the um, end of the presentation. So in this case, my PR interval is normal. So I can check that box. The last thing I want to do is measure my QRS complex. So again, I want to find one that starts on the solid line if I can, this one does. So I'm gonna measure one box and then I'm gonna trace down my QRS complex all the way to the J point. So it turns into the XP segment right here. So that means that my QRS duration is two boxes or 0 0.08 seconds. We want it to be less than three boxes. So 0 0.08 is less than 0 0.12, which means I have a normal QRS complex duration. So this strip checks all the boxes for being sinus rhythm and thus it is sinus rhythm. On your exam, you will have strips that are sinus rhythm. So please don't talk yourself out of every strip thinking that they can't be sinus rhythm because this is a dysrhythmia exam. If it looks like sinus rhythm and it walks like sinus rhythm and it talks like sinus rhythm, it probably is sinus rhythm. And so if that's one of your answer options, choose it with confidence as long as you've done all the checks that need to be done. The next rhythm we'll talk about is sinus bradycardia. So sinus bradycardia, it follows all of the same rules and regulations of sinus rhythm. It's just that our heart rate is less than 60 beats per minute. So we are lower than that normal range of 60 to 100, but we still have everything else just as it would be with regular sinus rhythm. Our next rhythm is sinus tachycardia. Sinus tachycardia, again, checks all of the boxes that sinus rhythm checks. It has all of the checks and balances in place. The only difference is that it is higher than 100 beats per minute, and we say that it will be less than 150 beats per minute. And this is because when we reach rates of above 150 beats per minute, for a regular rhythm, if it's greater than 150 beats per minute, usually our QRS complexes become so close to each other that we're unable to really identify the P wave. So we place those rhythms under an umbrella term known as supraventricular tachycardia. That's got um, many different rhythms that could be their fast rhythms. We can't really for sure say what they are because we need to be able to slow them down in order to say with confidence what they are. So we'll talk about SVT in a couple of slides from now in more detail. Atrial rhythms are next. So what I want you to remember with atrial rhythms is that they come from the atria. I know that sounds silly to say, but it's something that's very important to remember. If something comes from the atria, then the QRS complex is going to be narrow. It's going to be between 0 0.04 to 0 0.12 seconds or one to three small boxes. So just remember that if you see a narrow QRS complex, you're not going to choose an answer on your exam that has to do with the ventricle because that rhythm did not come from the ventricle. The reason we get concerned when someone is in an abnormal atrial rhythm is because their atria are not contracting normally. That means they don't have that normal upright and rounded P wave in lead two. And without that atrial contraction to contract and kick that extra blood into the ventricle, we lose something that we call atrial kick. Atrial kick can give people upwards of 25% of their cardiac output. So if we take that atrial kick away, say your patient is in a rhythm like a junctional rhythm or they're in a rhythm like AFib, then they are not getting that good extra cardiac output and extra contraction from the atria. And it can cause a lot of problems to occur as far as their perfusion within their body. So the other thing of note is that most atrial dysrhythmias are not life-threatening dysrhythmias. It doesn't mean that we don't wanna treat them quickly, but it just means that we probably aren't going to have to be calling a code blue on our patients if they're in an atrial dysrhythmia. The first one we'll discuss that I'm sure most of us have seen or are somewhat familiar with is atrial fibrillation. 
So in atrial fibrillation, we actually have the atria just kind of fibrillating. That means they're beating so quickly that they are not beating very efficiently. And they're just kind of shimmying or shaking back and forth because there's so many impulses and discharges that are being released from various points within the atria. So we don't have a very clear idea of what our P wave is with atrial fibrillation, because again, we're not having a good succinct contraction in the atria to cause a P wave. We're having more of a vibration or a fibrillation. So what you'll see is that you kind of have this wavy baseline where you don't really have discernible P wave. So when we go to identify our complexes, which is step one, we'll of course identify our QRS complex first. We can see that our QRS complex is nice and narrow here. So that again tells us that we have a rhythm that originated in the atria. We don't really have P waves that we can pick out. So that is another sign that we're likely in some type of atrial rhythm that's not sinus rhythm. And in this case, it's difficult for us to even see our T waves here. The next step is to determine the regularity of the strip. So we'll note when we determine the regularity using our piece of paper and shimmying down that our strip is going to be irregular. So remember that atrial fibrillation is an irregular rhythm. We are going to be unable to identify our P to QRS ratio, which is our, our, sorry, our next step is actually to determine the heart rate. I'm getting ahead of myself. So the next step is to determine the heart rate. So all we're going to do is count our QRS complexes and multiply by 10. So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So we have 10 QRS complexes times 10 is 100. So that means that we are in an atrial fibrillation at a rate of 100. Atrial fibrillation that is less than 100 or 100 or below, I should say, is considered normal atrial fibrillation. We would just call it atrial fibrillation. On the next slide, we'll show you an example of uh, atrial fibrillation that's above 100 beats per minute. And we have to differentiate that and call it atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response or AFib with RVR. It's a shortened term for that. So in this case, our AFib is 100 beats or less. In order to determine the PR interval, we would have to have a discernible P wave, and we don't in this case, so we actually cannot determine the PR interval for our AFib strip, which is another sign that we are likely in AFib. The next thing is to measure the QRS complex. So we'll find one that starts on a solid line. We'll measure the whole thing up to the J point. So this is probably about 0 0.06 seconds, which tells us that our QRS complex is within normal limits, that it's not too wide. It's narrow, which means that this rhythm is originating in the atria, as evidenced by the name of it, which is atrial fibrillation. So here's an example of AFib with rapid ventricular response, or AFib with RVR. If we measure or count the QRS complexes to determine the rate, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, so this uh, strip has a rate of 180 beats per minute. That's very fast. Anything greater than 100 with AFib, remember, has to be known as AFib with RVR. It will meet all the same criteria as the other AFib strip that we looked at. The next rhythm we'll discuss is a flutter. So I want you just to take a little bit of a mental picture of a flutter. I'm going to go back to the previous screen and show you what AFib looks like. So look at both of them, compare them in your mind, and understand that a flutter is not the same look as AFib. A flutter has these kind of sawtoothed waves in it. These sawtoothed waves are known as flutter waves, and they look a lot different than that wavy baseline that we saw in atrial fibrillation. So a lot of times on the exam, people mistake a flutter for AFib and AFib for a flutter. So please take a moment to recognize the flutter waves and it should be a quick answer for you to say, oh, I see the flutter waves, that's a flutter. A flutter can be um, regular or irregular. Again, it's easy to pick out the QRS complex, but it's kind of challenging to pick out our T waves because sometimes the T waves look sort of like the flutter waves do. And then our P waves actually don't exist. We have these flutter waves. We have this kind of re-entry circuit that's happening in the heart. So that's why the waves all look the same as a re-entry circuit, usually around the AV node that causes these flutter waves to occur. So your QRS complex though is still going to be narrow because it's coming from the atria, the A flutter. So if we measure the QRS complex, let's try and find one that starts on a line. This one sort of does. We've got one, two, 
two, three, and maybe a little bit small boxes, but I would stop at about three, um, showing that this QRS complex measures approximately three boxes, which is a normal duration for the QRS complex. So just remember it's characterized by those sawtooth waves. It should be a quick answer on your test when you see the sawtooth waves. So we've got supraventricular tachycardia up next. I did mention SVT is the shortened version um, of this in our sinus tachycardia slide. What I want you to also understand is that on your exam, they're going to um, call SVT by its acronym name. So supraventricular tachycardia, also known as SVT. And they do refer to it also as atrioventricular nodal reentry tachycardia. So please don't think that they're talking about a different type of rhythm when those terms are thrown out there. SVT and atrioventricular nodal reentry tachycardia are the same thing. So with our SVT, it's important for us to understand the characteristics so that we can properly answer our question. So it's very fast. It's going to be greater than 150. Remember, if we're in a rhythm that's regular and it's less than 150, we can usually see the P wave if it exists. So we would be able to differentiate between sinus tachycardia, let's say, and a junctional tachycardia where we may not have a normal P wave. But when we get into SVT with these really high rates, as you can see, we can't really see the P wave anymore. So we don't really know if it exists or not. So this is just an umbrella term that covers off many different fast atrial rhythms. SVT is always going to be regular. So that's where I want you to understand the difference between SVT and AFib. The previous um, slide that we looked at with AFib with RVR, it was very fast. It was 180 beats per minute. But AFib was irregular, and this is regular. So if you have something very fast that is regular, then it is SVT. It is not going to be AFib. We already discussed the point about the P waves. The rhythm originates above the ventricle, so that means that the QRS complex is narrow. Supraventricular means above the ventricle. So your QRS complex is going to be narrow. So if we find one that starts on a solid line, such as this one, we have QRS. We would want to measure until it turns into the ST segment. This QRS complex is probably about a box and a half to so 0.06 seconds, which means it's within the normal range of 0.04 to 0.12 seconds. So SBT is all of these things, and it's very important for you to understand the difference between SVT and some of the other atrial rhythms that we're going to discuss as we move along here. The next thing that we'll talk about is junctional rhythms. Now, technically, junctional rhythms come from the AV node or the junction between the atria and the ventricle, but they're still coming from high enough above the ventricle that your QRS complex is going to be narrow. So when we talk about junctional rhythms, a lot of times people get confused between, um, again, the junctional rhythm and AFib or the junctional rhythm and our SVT because all three of those aren't going to have normal P waves. So pay attention as we move along this section to understand the different types of junctional rhythms, first of all, based off of the rate. And second of all, what the differences are between these junctional rhythms and AFib and SVT. So we'll talk about P waves here one more time. With junctional rhythms, you are not going to have a normal P wave. A normal P wave looks like this. It comes from the SA node and it's upright and rounded and leads to. If you have an inverted P wave, which is upside down, that means it did not come from the SA node. That impulse is moving away from the positive pole of lead two. It's going backwards from the AB node to the SA node and it's causing that inverted appearance. So this would be an inverted P wave coming from the AB node. You can also have no P wave at all in a junctional rhythm. So the impulse maybe wasn't strong enough or the tract was broken back to the SA node so that AV impulse does not travel backwards and cause the inverted P wave. So you'll have um, no P wave at all. Lastly, you can have what's called a retrograde P wave. So that means the P wave comes after the QRS complex. Well, we know that the heart is supposed to have atrial contraction and then ventricular contraction. It doesn't have ventricular contraction, then atrial contraction, then atrial contraction again. So if you see a P wave coming after a QRS complex, that means it did not come from the sinus node. It probably came from somewhere in the atria and it was discharged after the QRS complex and it was just picked up at that specific place in time. But it did not come from the SA node, so you are not in a sinus rhythm. Let's run through some characteristics of junctional rhythms. So remember junctional rhythms come from the AV node. So the SA node was up here, that was our sinus rhythms. All of our sinus rhythms were regular. 
as we move down to the AV node at the junction, all of your junctional rhythms are also going to be regular because we're still kind of on that fast lane highway that's natural conduction through the conduction system. So your junctional rhythms are all going to be regular rhythms. Junctional is um, going to have a nice narrow QRS complex as we identify our complexes here. We have a T wave following our QRS complex. But when we search for a P wave, we don't see one in this case. So our P wave is going to be absent. The next um, step in our analysis is to identify the regularity. We'll um, mark our QRS complexes on our piece of paper and move all the way down the strip. In this case, we do have a regular rhythm. Remember, junctional rhythms are always going to be regular. Measuring the rate, we'll count our QRS complexes, one, two, three, four, five, and we'll multiply by 10. That will give us a rate of 50. So when we come down here and we look at a regular rate range for junctional rhythms, we can see that 50 lands right in the middle of 40 and 60, which is our normal range for junctional rhythm. So we talk next about our PR interval, or P to QRS ratio, my apologies. We don't have P waves, so we don't have a P to QRS ratio. PR interval measurement, if we don't have a P wave, we can't measure a PR interval. Now this says less than 0.12 is present, it's not really a true PR interval. So truly, I would say that you can't measure the PR interval in a junctional rhythm. Last was to measure the QRS complex. So let's try and find one that starts on a solid line. This one almost does. I would say it's about a box, or sorry, half a box off. Of note too, when you're measuring things, you can measure half a box. Please don't measure thirds and quarters of boxes or anything like that, but a half box answer will show up on your exam. So for example, if you have two and a half boxes for your QRS complex, that would be 0 0.10 seconds. That's acceptable. You could certainly have an answer like that. Just don't measure anything less than half of a box because it just becomes negligible at that point. So here's half a box, and then we have a whole box turning into our ST segment. So I would say this is about 0 0.06 seconds for this QRS complex. That's within our normal limit of 0 0.04 to 0 0.12. Again, junctional rhythms come from that junction. They come from high enough up in the conduction system that we're not in the ventricle, so we don't have a wide QRS complex. So I think everything um, within this box we've already touched on. So these are just kind of takeaways for what a junctional rhythm is. The next rhythm we'll discuss is accelerated junctional. The normal rate for junctional was 0. Point, or sorry, 40 to 60 beats per minute. If we look at the rate of this strip, counting the QRS complex, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, we can see that we have eight QRS complexes, eight times 10 is 80, which gives us a rate of 80. 80 falls out of that normal range of 40 to 60. We're above 40 to 60 now, so we can't call it regular junctional, we have to call it accelerated junctional. It is very important for you to understand these rates for your exam. There are many junctional rhythms on that exam. And a lot of times there will be multiple answers that say junctional within them. So you need to be able to understand which one is correct based off of the heart rate that's noted in the strip. The next junctional rhythm that we'll discuss is junctional tachycardia. So if we count the QRS complexes in this strip, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 14 times 10 is 140. So that gives us a rate that is greater than 100. So it's more than accelerated junctional, but it's less than 150. Now, why does it need to be less than 150? Because if you recall from the SBT slide, that SBT runs at rates above 150. And at that point, our QRS complexes get so close to each other that we lose the ability to see the P waves accurately. So we don't know if they exist or they don't exist. So that's why junctional tachycardia has a cutoff of 150 beats per minute. So again, understand that junctional tachycardia will look exactly like a junctional rhythm. It's just that the rate is greater than 100, but less than 150. This is a good slide just to recap all of your different rates for junctional rhythms. Again, I will emphasize that there are a lot of junctional rhythms on your exam. So you need to be able to identify them and know the differences in the rate. So normal junctional rhythm is 40 to 60. Above 60, but less than 100 or up to 100 is accelerated junctional and greater than 100, 101 to 150 is going to be junctional tachycardia. If we get above 150, it is going to be SVT. 
Next we'll discuss ventricular rhythm. So ventricular rhythms start somewhere in the ventricles. That means they're starting below the junction here in the ventricular area of the myocardium. So what we'll see with these rhythms is that first of all, we won't have a P wave because remember P waves are generated from the SA nodes and we've moved far down the line here away from the atria where any P wave activity would be created. We're now in the ventricle area. So we'll have no P wave and we're going to have a wide QRS complex because as I mentioned, when we move down into this area of the conduction system, the contraction and the depolarization becomes a lot less efficient. So it takes longer for the QRS complex to be created and longer for the ventricle to contract or squeeze. So that's the widening that you see of the QRS complex, making it greater than 0.12 seconds or greater than three small boxes on your EKG. So people get confused also between junctional rhythms and ventricular rhythms because both of them do not have P waves. But if you recall from the previous section when we talked about junctional rhythms, Junctional rhythms have a narrow QRS complex, meaning that the QRS complex is one to three small boxes. Ventricular rhythms are going to have a wide QRS complex, meaning that the QRS complex is greater than 0.12 seconds and they still don't have a P wave. So that's how you can differentiate between those two. Sometimes we have to get down to measuring that QRS complex to determine whether it's a junctional rhythm or a ventricular rhythm. The first rhythm that we'll discuss is an idioventricular rhythm. So this is just a plain idioventricular rhythm. What we'll see is that, first of all, this is a lethal rhythm. So most ventricular rhythms are going to be lethal. That means that your patient could potentially code from the rhythm, and we need to be at the patient's bedside helping them with ACLS or um, whatever the indication that they need is right away. So with idioventricular rhythms, if we start from the beginning with our analysis, we're going to identify our complexes. So we have a QRS complex here. Um, it's going pointing downwards, but we still have our nice pointy QRS complex. If we have a QRS complex, we have to have a T. Now you can see the T looks a little bit odd here. The depolarization um, when it starts in the ventricle is very different than if it starts in the sinus node. So our depolarization looks quite different and it also causes our repolarization to look quite different. So that's why your T wave kind of looks odd in this case. As you can see, we do not have a P wave. So we have a QRS and a T, but no P. The next thing is to determine the regularity. So we'll map out from the beginning of the strip to the end using our little pen brackets and we will determine that this is in fact a regular rhythm. From there, we will determine what the heart rate is. So we'll count our QRS complexes, one, two, three, four, five, and we'll multiply that by 10, and that will give us a heart rate of 50. So with idioventricular rhythms, in particular on your test, please understand that up to 50 is still going to be considered idioventricular. If it's 51 to 100, then it will be accelerated idioventricular, which we'll discuss on the next slide. So this falls into our regular rate range for idioventricular. We don't have any P waves, so we can't measure our P to QRS ratio. And we don't have a P wave, so we can't measure our PR interval. We can, however, measure our QRS complex, which is very important. So let's try and find one that starts on a solid line, such as this one. We'll measure one, two, three, four, five to the J point. So five boxes for our QRS complex. We know that normal is 0 0.04, which is one box, to 0 0.12, which is three boxes. So this exceeds that normal range for the duration of the QRS complex. And that's what actually puts us into a ventricular rhythm. So we are above our normal QRS complex duration, meaning we're in the ventricle, meaning it's a ventricular rhythm. Next is accelerated idioventricular. So it's going to have all of the same characteristics of an idioventricular rhythm. It's just going to be greater in its rate. So I would say 51 for your exam. You might want to just cross out 50 here and write 51. 51 to 100 is going to be accelerated idioventricular. It's still a lethal rhythm. It's just that for some reason, um, because probably the cardiac output is dropping, the conduction system has said, okay, I need to pick up my socks here and I need to go a little bit faster to generate more cardiac output. But it's usually not sustainable for that um, accelerated rate to last. So usually your patient, if they're not already running into some struggles, they will be because their heart rate will eventually drop down.
So just remember you don't have a P wave, but you also have a YQRS complex, which differentiates this from junctional rhythm. Ventricular tachycardia is next. So we should be able to quickly identify VP. If we see VP on our patient, we need to run to their bedside immediately and we need to see if they have a pulse. If they do not have a pulse, then we need to defibrillate them as soon as possible and of course start CPR even before that. If they do have a pulse, then we don't defibrillate them. We do something called synchronized cardioversion or we may even give them some medications to try and control the VP. So we still have QRS complexes in VT. They're just pointing down and we do still have T waves in VT. So because we have QRS complexes, it's an organized looking rhythm. Um, I want you guys to understand that in comparison to one of the V fib strips that I'll show you. A lot of people always mistake it for VT, um, but V fib is not organized. VT is very organized. We still have QRS complexes in T's. Um, it is a lethal rhythm. It is usually a regular rhythm unless we're in um, a form of VT known as torsades. Um, so it is organized, just please understand that. The QRS complexes though, however, they're very wide, right? They're even greater. This one's almost two large boxes in duration. So it's coming from the ventricle, it's very wide. It is not a rhythm that allows for very good cardiac output. So if your patient already um, doesn't have a pulse, then they probably will soon. So we need to treat them as soon as possible. There's different types of VT. We can have monomorphic, which means it's coming from one area of the ventricle that's irritated. Remember, any cell in your heart can generate an impulse. So we have one little cell that's kind of taking over the conduction and it's coming from one usually irritated spot. It's usually an irritated heart muscle that's not getting what it needs as far as electrolytes or oxygen that goes into VTAC in the first place. So one irritated spot here. Here we have many irritated spots. We have the VT coming from several different areas within the ventricle. So this is a little bit more of a stable rhythm than the polymorphic would be. Next for ventricular rhythms is ventricular fibrillation. Now, of course, this is a lethal rhythm. This means that our conduction system is not functioning at all. We just have the ventricle. And again, it's just kind of vibrating in place. It's not able to squeeze. It's not generating any type of cardiac output. So your patient is not gonna have a pulse. We need to start CPR right away. And we need to defibrillate them ASAP to try and reset the conduction system and get them back into um, a perfusing rhythm. There's different types of V-fib. So please for your exam, understand the difference between these two. We have coarse V-fib, which is higher amplitude. Remember we have time running this way, we have amplitude running this way. So this, these are higher amplitude waves of V-fib. Please don't get confused and think these are QRS complexes because they are not. This is not VTAC, this is coarse V-fib. And I would probably memorize what this strip looks like for your exam. Uh, below that, we have fine V-fib, so that just means that we have less amplitude, um, but we still have kind of a wavy baseline, so this doesn't look like asystole. Asystole is more of like a flat line. Um, we still have some little fluctuations from the baseline for our fine V-fib. Next section here, we'll talk about premature complexes. So there's three different types of premature complexes. Uh, for the purposes of your exam, you do not have PJCs on your exam, so please understand what PACs look like and what PVCs look like. Um, it is important to be able to differentiate between PACs and sometimes people think it's like a heart block. So we'll discuss the differences on the next slide here. So just to break down what exactly a premature contraction is, um, if we have a premature baby, for example, that means that our baby came a little bit earlier than they were supposed to come. And this is the same thing with a premature contraction. So it comes a little bit earlier than it was supposed to come. If our patient's in sinus rhythm, then we can fairly confidently anticipate when the next beat's gonna come. It's fairly regular, right? But with a PAC, we have a beat that comes through a little bit sooner than anticipated. So it does cause the rhythm to become irregular. What happens is we have an early beat. So in this case, this is our early beat here. And after that early beat comes in, we have what we call a compensatory pause because the sinus node kind of pauses and resets itself before the next beat comes in on time. So if we look at these two complexes and we map them out and then we move down the line to the next one, just as we would when we're determining the regularity of our strip, the next anticipated beat was supposed to come here, but it in fact came early. 
Other than that, for a PAC, it comes early, but it has all the other pieces of a sinus beat. So it's got a P, a narrow QRS complex, and a T wave. And that is what a PAC looks like. It looks like a sinus beat. It just comes a little bit early. So identify PACs for your exam. Um, it's going to be an irregular rhythm. It's going to have a normal PR interval and it's going to have a normal QRS measurement. And that's what's going to help you differentiate between a PAC and a PVC. So PVCs we'll discuss next. We have a PVC over here. PVCs kind of look like the elephant in the room. They're usually really easy to pick out because they don't look anything like a sinus B or anything like the other beats on your rhythm strip. Um, when we identify premature complexes, we want to identify the underlying rhythm first and then we superimpose on the end of that underlying rhythm what the premature contraction actually is. So in the previous slide, I'll just go back to it so that you guys can look at it as I'm talking about it. The previous slide here, we were talking about premature atrial contractions or PACs. We wouldn't just say, oh, this patient's in PACs. We would say that they are in sinus rhythm with PACs. We would need to identify what's going on with these two beats. So it could be, you know, sinus rhythm, sinus bradycardia, whatever it is with PACs. In this case, we would say that the patient is in sinus rhythm with a PVC because they have normal sinus rhythm for most of their beats, and then we just see one PVC here. The characteristics of your PVC are going to be that, remember, they're premature ventricular contractions, so they come from the ventricle. When things come from the ventricle, the QRS complex is wide, and we don't have a P wave, just as we saw in our ventricular rhythm from the previous section. So they're wide, that means the QRS complex here is going to be greater than 0.12 seconds, and we don't have a P wave. And they can go in all different types of directions. So um, they're usually fairly easy to pick out because they are kind of the elephant in the room. So that's the best way to identify them. They can come in different groupings. So you need to know this for your exam as well. If you have every second beat as a PVC, that means that you're in a bigeminal rhythm. So I have a regular beat, PVC, regular beat, PVC. Every other beat, bigeminal rhythm. We also have what we call trigemini. So that means every third beat is a PVC, normal beat, normal beat, PVC. Please understand the difference between these two. I can't tell you how many times on the exam people say that bigeminy is trigemini and vice versa. So please understand the difference between these two rhythms and memorize it. When we're interpreting the strip, we already discussed this, we want to identify the underlying rhythm and then we'll talk about what the premature complexes are on top of it. So this would be sinus rhythm with PVCs. We wouldn't just say that the patient is in PVCs. The other thing that I'll point out um, is that you can have two PVCs in a row. If you have two PVCs in a row, we would call that a ventricular couplet. So other important rhythms we'll talk about now, asystole. So asystole, of course, is a lethal rhythm. That means we have no organized or really any electrical conduction running through the myocardium. For uh, asystole, we do not shock asystole. We will want to start CPR, get our ACLS going, of course, get the patient hooked up to the coke heart still, and then we will just start giving them medications like epinephrine. So good CPR is key in asystole. We can also have paced rhythms. These are going to show up on your exam as well. So to identify if something's a paced rhythm, you're going to look for these little pacer spikes. If you're V-paced, such as in this example down here, you'll note that the QRS complex is wide, but we're not gonna say the patient's in a ventricular rhythm, we're gonna look for these pacer spikes. And then we'll say that the patient is being ventricularly paced. If they are atrially and ventricularly paced, we'll see a spike in the P wave, and then we'll see another spike in the QRS complex. So this patient is AV paced or dual chamber paced, and you're going to have to know the difference between those two things for your test. All right, we're gonna talk about heart blocks next. So I'm just gonna pull up the PowerPoint here again. My apologies for even closing it out in the first place. So heart blocks are something that's a little bit tricky for people to wrap their minds around. So we're gonna take our time through this section. I'm hoping that um, by the end of it, you'll have a clearer idea of how to identify the differences between the various heart blocks. So in order to understand how blocks originate in the first place, we can actually just break down the name of the block. So blocks are generally called AV blocks or atrioventricular blocks. 
my apologies, my computer is about to die. Um, they're called atrioventricular blocks because they actually originate from the atrioventricular node. So if we can understand that the AV node is the issue, sometimes that can help us to A, identify that we're in a heart block and B, identify what type of heart block it is based off of what we're seeing in the PR interval. Because if you recall way back from the beginning of the lecture, the PR interval is a good indicator of what's going on with our AV node because it symbolizes that pause between the P wave, which is atrial contraction, and the QRS complex, which is the ventricular contraction. And the AV node is, remember, it's kind of like the gatekeeper or the bouncer, and it decides what goes from the atria down into the ventricle. So if that pause is acting odd, then it's usually an indication that there's something going on with the AV node. So as the PR segment or the PR interval in our case for simplicity purposes, lengthens or you know, changes in a certain pattern, we can identify what kind of heart block the patient is in. So in a first degree heart block, what happens is we have a rhythm that looks much like sinus rhythm. It checks pretty much all the boxes for sinus rhythm, except the PR interval is greater than 0 0.20 seconds or five small boxes. So if we look at the rhythm from our analysis from the beginning, we can identify that we have a QRS complex, we have our T wave, and that makes this our P wave. If we look at the regularity of the strip, this is something that's very important to note. The strip is regular. It's a regular rhythm. So if it helps you to kind of put these different heart blocks into different categories and kind of write the different characteristics of them underneath, that might um, assist with your ability to compare them and figure out which one's which. So if you take out a piece of paper and you write at the top first degree AV block, underneath that you'll write regular rhythm. The next thing that is important to note is that the PR interval is prolonged. So if we measure our PR interval, um, we'll measure it. Actually, let me backtrack. Um, let's identify our P to QRS ratio first. So if we look at our P to QRS ratio here, we can see that we have a one-to-one -one P to QRS ratio, meaning we're not missing any QRS complexes in our first degree AV blocks. You could write on your piece of paper under regular rhythm, no missing QRS complexes. From there, we'll measure out our PR interval because as we know, the blocks have some type of issue with the PR interval. It's either too long or it's variable, one of those things. So in this case, let's find a P wave that begins on a solid line, such as this one. We'll count out our white boxes. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we have nine boxes. That's way too long for a PR interval. A normal PR interval is three to five boxes. So let's find another one to measure because we want to measure more than one. The reason being that some of our heart blocks have variable PR intervals. So let's measure another one to be sure. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine for this one as well. So we would say that our PR interval is prolonged, but it is fixed, it doesn't change. So underneath um, your little criteria for a first degree heart block, let's write down PR interval prolonged and fixed. So those are the main characteristics of your first degree heart block. What happens is the SA node discharges a P wave that means the atria contract. The AV node is the next spot that that impulse travels to. The AV node holds on to it for a period of time. But in this case, it holds on to it for a little bit longer than it's supposed to. And then it does let it go down into the ventricle, though. And we know that because the P wave turns into a QRS complex. We're not missing any QRS complexes. So let's talk about our next type of heart block. So on your little piece of paper, if you're marking down the criteria, let's write second degree type 1 heart block. When we go through and identify our complexes, we have QRS, we then have a T, and we have our P. Um, as we just glance at the strip though, we can see that we are missing a QRS complex here. And we'll get, that to, get to that in just a moment from now. If we map out the regularity of the strip, we'll see that it is irregular because we're missing this QRS complex here. So under second degree type one heart block, let's write irregular rhythm 
The next thing is to look at our P to QRS ratio. So we can see we have P and QRS here. We also have it here, we have it here, but then here we have a P wave and we don't have a QRS complex. So we could say that in our second degree type one heart block, we're missing a QRS complex. Our P to QRS ratio is not one to one, it is off. The next thing for your heart block is to identify what the PR interval is and whether that PR interval is fixed or variable. So let's try and find one here that starts on a solid line. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. So we have five boxes for this first PR interval. That's actually a normal PR interval even, but let's move down. We always have to measure more than one. So let's measure another one here. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and probably a half small boxes. So that means our PR interval in this case is variable. Um, so it's getting longer. What I would suggest is underneath your criteria, let's write PR interval prolonged, because remember this one was too long and variable. So what we can see with a second degree type one, it's also known as a winky box. The PR interval actually prolongs in a very predictable way. It goes longer, 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 and then drop. We say we drop a QRS complex. The rhyme is then you have a winky box. The other way to remember that is that you're going to wink with one eye. So one Q or sorry, second degree type one correlates with your winky box. You wink with one eye. We have a progressive elongation of the PR interval until we drop a QRS complex. So what happens is the the AB node, the SA node fires, the AB node catches that impulse and it holds on to it for longer, longer, longer until finally here the AB node never lets that P wave go through to the ventricle and become the QRS complex. So the issue with this rhythm is that every time we drop a QRS complex, we're dropping a beat basically, we're not contracting the ventricle and we're not sending blood out to the patient's body and generating blood pressure and cardiac output. So it can, um, if we drop the QRS complex is frequent enough, we can cause a drop in the patient's blood pressure and issues with their perfusion. The next one that we'll discuss is a second degree type two. So in a second degree type two, we'll identify that we have a QRS. If you have a QRS, you have to have a T. This T and this P are kind of best friends here, but we do have a T. That makes this RP. So in this scenario, um, we'll next map out um, the regularity of the strip. So if we march out um, the QRS complexes and slide our paper all the way from the beginning to the end, we'll see that the strip is irregular. And it's irregular because here we're missing a QRS complex. The next thing is to determine what our PR interval is. So when we look at our PR interval here, we're going to try and find a P wave that starts on a solid line. If we can, this one starts on a fairly solid line. So we'll count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that is too long for our PR interval. It's um, greater than 0 0.20 seconds or five boxes. Of course, we're always gonna measure more than one. So let's try and find another one that starts on a solid line. This one does. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and probably a half for this one. So this one was eight, the other one seven and a half. That's fairly close. If we wanted to be completely confident that our PR interval was fixed, we would measure one more. So let's take, um, let's do this one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight for this one as well. So they're all kind of in the same ballpark as each other. We've got eight and a seven and a half. So we would say that the PR interval is prolonged, but it's six. So underneath your criteria with second degree heart walk type two, we're gonna write irregular rhythm. And then below that, we're gonna write PR interval prolonged, but fixed. Or your PR interval in this case can actually even be a normal PR interval, but, and it's always going to be fixed. So just PR interval is always fixed. But remember, we dropped a QRS complex. So we also want to say that QRS complexes are dropped in this case. So the difference between a second degree type one and a second degree type two is that in second degree type one, our PR interval was variable. It got longer, 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 and we dropped. In a second degree type two, we have a fixed PR interval, meaning that although we dropped QRS complexes like we did here, the PR interval doesn't change. So the second degree type one was a little bit of a predictable rhythm. We were able to predict when that AV node wasn't going to conduct a QRS complex and it was gonna drop it. 
In a second degree type two, it's not as predictable. We don't really know when the AV node is going to not conduct a QRS complex. So this rhythm is more unstable um, and the patient's going to require more attention. With a second degree type two, sometimes they can start dropping more than one QRS complex in a row as well. And that really can decrease the patient's cardiac output and perfusion. So the last block that we'll discuss is a third degree heart block. A third degree heart block, we have um, our QRS complexes, which we'll identify. We have our T wave. If we have a QRS, we have to have a T. And then we do have P waves, but the P waves are actually not associated with the QRS complexes because a third degree heart block is also known as a complete heart block. That means that the AV node for the previous three heart blocks that we've talked about, it was working, but it just wasn't working normally. In a third degree heart block, the AV node is not working at all. So that means that the sinus node is still working. It's still generating P waves. The AV node, which is supposed to take those P waves and travel them down into the ventricle to become a QRS complex is not working at all. So what the ventricle does is it can't see anything coming from above because remember the AV node is not working and it is the communication from the sinus node to the ventricle. So what the ventricle does is it starts just generating its own beat down below. Just as we discussed with ventricular rhythms, the heart doesn't want the patient to die. So it is just gonna start generating its own very slow beat. But the QRS complexes and the P waves don't have anything to do with each other because the AV node isn't there to communicate the P waves down to the ventricle. So what we'll note in our third degree heart block is that the QRS complexes are actually coming in at regular intervals. So what you can write down, because remember they're being generated from the ventricle. So what you can write down on your sheet is third degree heart block, regular rhythm. We do usually have more P waves than QRS complexes in a third degree heart block. So what we see here is we have a P wave here. We actually do have a P wave hidden in this QRS complex. We have a P wave here. Uh, we have another one right here and here and here. So we have more P waves than QRS complexes. If we look at our PR interval, uh, we can measure this one out, for example. So we've got one, and then this is pretty much five, 10, 15, 16, 17, 18. So this PR interval would be considered like 19 boxes. We all know that is way, 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 way too long. If we look at, look at the next one here, it's one, two, three, and then we've got five, 10. So this one's probably about 13. So the PR interval is variable. So you can write underneath PR interval variable. There's no relationship between P and QRS. What that means is that everything that we discussed with the AV node being broken, but your P waves are going to be regular because your sinus node's still beating in sinus. It's just that those P waves aren't turning into anything and within the ventricle to become a QRS complex. So your ventricle started up its own rhythm. That's also a regular rhythm. And that's your QRS complexes that you see that are coming in at regular intervals. So just to recap for your blocks, if we go look at our little sheet, the sinus rhythm with a first degree AV block or sinus bradycardia with a first degree AV block, the first degree AV block, we like to identify it sort of how we identified our premature complexes. We identify the underlying rhythm and then we add on that it has a first degree AV block. So this was a regular rhythm. There was a P for every QRS. We didn't drop any QRS complexes. The PR interval was fixed, but it was prolonged. Moving down to a second degree type one, it was an irregular rhythm because we dropped QRS complexes. The PR interval was variable and it also got longer, longer, longer and dropped. Second degree type two was also an irregular rhythm. What happened here was our PR interval was fixed. So second degree type one, we had a variable, variable PR interval. Second degree type two, we have a fixed PR interval. So that's the main difference between those two. We still dropped QRS complexes with the second degree type two. A third degree heart block, we had a regular rhythm because our ventricles were beating independent of our atria. So they started generating their own regular rhythm. We had a regular rhythm and we had variable PR intervals. 
So that's kind of how you can recap and determine the difference between all of these various heart blocks. So now we'll go into some practice. I know that you guys already had the answer circled on your sheets and that's okay. We're still going to discuss how we actually got to the answer. So in this um, example here, we're just trying to determine what the heart rate is. So to determine the heart rate, all we're going to do is count the number of QRS complexes and multiply by 10. However, we need to identify what our QRS complex is so that we know what we're counting. So in this case, we're gonna find our sepal, that's these guys right here, and we're gonna start counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we have nine times 10 gives us 90. So the correct answer would be A. Remember, if you don't have the answer that's exact, you'll just choose the answer that's closest to the number that you're getting. Here's another example. We'll count our QRS complexes. So we've identified this is our QRS, this is our T, this is our P. We'll count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight QRS complexes giving us a heart rate of 80. One last example of our heart rate, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven QRS complexes. Here you can see the QRS complex is cut off just slightly. So that means that we don't have a full QRS complex here. Um, so even though we counted seven QRS complexes, our heart rate is gonna be 65 because we didn't have a full QRS complex here. And you may see a strip like this on your test. So pay attention to that. Next, we'll measure our PR interval. So our PR interval, we have a measurement from the beginning of the P wave to the start of the QRS complex. Um, we want to try and find a PR interval that starts on a solid line if we can. If we can't do that and it's difficult for us to see, we're gonna wanna hold up that piece of paper, mark the beginning of the P wave and mark the end where it turns into the QRS complex. So this one, I think, is about as close to a solid line as we're going to get. I would probably start measuring it about halfway through this box. We've got one, two, three, four. I would probably say about four and a half boxes, um, which would be 0 0.18. But I have two answers that are very close to each other here. So I'm going to pick another one and measure that. Here I have one, two, three, four. So that one was four. Let's do one more, one, two, three, four. So I would say more likely 0 0.16 is the average PR interval on this strip, which is my answer being D right there. For this one, we'll measure out the PR interval. So we can see that this PR interval is one, two, um, very long. We've got three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Uh, if we move over to another one, we always want to measure more than one. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. So 19 and 13, um, those are very far apart as far as my measurements. So I would choose A for this one because my PR interval is variable in this case. This is what your questions will look like that I didn't ask you to identify the cardiac rhythm. So the cardiac rhythm, we can start by using our steps for analyzing our rhythm strip, and we can slowly start to eliminate answers down here based off of what we're getting um, as far as our answers. So the first thing is to identify T, QRS, and T. So here we have a P, our QRS complex, my apologies, and then we have a T. I don't really see a P here. So I can look down at my list here and say, which rhythms that are listed here do not have P waves? that I can easily pick out. So sinus tachycardia is going to have P waves that I can pick out so I can eliminate that answer. AFib does not have discernible P waves. So I'm going to eliminate that one, or sorry, I'm gonna keep that as an option. Um, SVT does not have discernible P waves. So I have to keep that as an option and junctional rhythms do not have discernible P waves. So I also have to keep that as an option. The only one I was able to eliminate is sinus tachycardia. So let's move on to our next step. Our next step is to determine the regularity. So I'm gonna hold up my piece of paper. I'm gonna mark two R waves and then I'm gonna move all the way down the strip to determine regularity. In this case, my strip is regular. So now I'm gonna come back to my remaining answers and say, which one can I eliminate based off of regularity, if any. Well, AFib is not a regular rhythm, so I can already eliminate that. So now I'm down to just two answers. SBT is regular, 
and junctional tachycardia is regular. So I can't eliminate either one of those as answer options. So let's move on to the next step. The next step is to determine the heart rate. So we'll count the number of QRS complexes and multiply by 10. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. We've got 14 QRS complexes times 10 is 140. The difference between junctional tachycardia and SVT is actually the rate. So if it's greater than 150, it's going to be SVT. If it's less than 150, it's going to be junctional tachycardia. So in this case, my rate is 140, so my answer is junctional tachycardia. So that's how you should work through the different rhythms on your test to determine what that rhythm is, is and you can just eliminate answers as you go. The next one here, we'll start with identifying our P, QRS, and T. So I've got a QRS. I have a T and I have a P. So can I eliminate any answers here because they don't have all of those components? Well, sinus rhythm has all of those components. Sinus Brady has all of those components. Junctional rhythm does not have a P wave. So I can eliminate junctional as an option and sinus rhythm does have a P wave. So I have to keep the remaining three. Next is to determine the regularity. This is a regular strip. Of course, I would mark it out, but all three of my remaining options are also regular, so I can't eliminate anything. The next thing I would do is determine the rate. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven QRS complexes times 10 gives me a rate of 70. I can eliminate sinus bradycardia now because sinus bradycardia is below 60 beats per minute. So I'm left with sinus rhythm with a first degree AV block and just sinus rhythm. The difference between these two is the PR interval. So I'm just gonna jump right ahead and measure the PR interval and see if it's prolonged or regular. So let's find a PR interval that lands on a line if we can. I would say this one's the closest. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I've got eight boxes for my PR interval. So I am going to eliminate sinus rhythm as an option and A would be my correct answer. In this case, we're going to start from the beginning. So we've got QRS, we have a T, but I can't really pick out any P waves. So what options do I have here that don't have P waves? Junctional tachycardia doesn't have P waves, AFib doesn't have P waves and with RVR and regular AFib doesn't, but sinus tachycardia does. So I'm gonna eliminate sinus tachycardia as an option. Next thing is to determine the regularity. So when I mark out my QRS complex on this strip, I will note that it is irregular. I can eliminate junctional tachycardia because junctional tachycardia is a regular rhythm. So I'm left with AFib with RVR or AFib. Now I know the difference between those is simply the heart rate. So I'm gonna count my QRS complexes to determine the heart rate. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 QRS complexes times 10 is 180. AFib with RVR is 100 to 100 and above. It's 100 to above. Anything above that, I'm gonna have AFib with RVR. So I can eliminate regular AFib as an option and I'm going to choose AFib with RVR. Now, a lot of people get confused between AFib and SVT because SVT is really fast too, right? Remember that AFib is irregular, SVT is regular. So AFib, anything above 100 is AFib with RVR. With SVT, if it is greater than 150, it's regular, there's no P waves and it's got a narrow QRS complex, it's SVT. The difference between those two is the regularity. To measure the QRS complex, I am going to try and find a QRS complex that lands on a line. So when my question asks me to measure the QRS complex, I will simply either mark the beginning and the end and move it up to the grid so I can get it away from the busyness of the strip. Or if I can see and find one that lands on a line, I'll measure one all the way to the J point. So I've got two boxes here. That gives me 0 0.08. Now I don't see an answer that is 0 0.08, but the closest to 0 0.08 is going to be 0 0.10. So I'm gonna choose that as my option. I would probably measure more than one QRS complex as well and try to take the average. In this case, we'll measure starting on this line because that is the easiest. So we've got one, two, three, four. We're gonna to go to where we turn into the J point. So I would say this is about 4.5 to five boxes. In this case, we've got one, two, three, four, probably and a half as well. So I would say 0 0.18, but I don't have that again as an option. Um, so I would choose 
something that is as close to that as possible. Here I have 0 0.20 or 0 0.16. So I'd probably try and measure a couple more to see where I'm at and see if I can find something a little bit closer. One, two, three, this one's about four. If I move over to this first one here, I've got one, two, three, four. So probably 0 0.16 would be the correct answer. So that's just an example of um, some practice questions. You can kind of figure out how you can start to narrow down answers on your test. Um, this is also some links that you can use for some more practice um, that will help you. So please make sure that you study lots, um, especially if you're feeling a little bit uncomfortable with this. You can watch the YouTube videos for how to do the measurements, determine the rate and the regularity. Hopefully that will assist as well. And then you've been given a practice booklet that has similar questions to the ones we just went through. So please do those, make sure that you're getting the correct answers. You'll also be given an answer key. If the answers you're getting are far off from the correct answers, as far as the measurements or the strip interpretation, please ask for some extra help prior to taking your exam. Um, you can reach out to your unit-based educator or you can reach out to the NSO coordinator and they will be able to hook you up with someone to give you a little bit of extra help prior to beginning the exam. So thanks everybody for your time and attention today and I hope you enjoy the rest of your orientation or if you're watching this for your annual EKG review, good luck on your exam either way and I hope to see everyone soon. Have a great rest of your day everybody.